the Jean Golding Institute International Women's Day lunchtime seminar. We're just waiting for a few people, a few more people to join us and then we will get cracking. I'm going to give it one more minute. Um, I'm here in person with one of our speakers. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to be recording the session today, so I hope that's okay. We're going to start recording in a moment. Just let the last few people join us. Okay. Just a couple of minutes past 12 o'clock, so I think we'll get cracking. Uh, my name is Kate Robson Brown. I'm the director of the Jean Golding Institute here at the University of Bristol. Um, I'm a professor of biological anthropology and engineering mathematics. Um, and it's an enormous privilege to be able to welcome our groups, our group of speakers, for our celebration of women in data science today. Um, I've been the director for about four years. This is my this is my fifth year. Um, my own research is around um, bone biology, bone computational biology, and how, and how human bone responds to extreme environments. But at the JGI, um, we manage projects really across the piece, um, foundational methodologies, societal challenges, data visualization, and everything in between. So today, I'm just gonna run through a few biogs and we can share this information um, uh, later on. You can move the slide on, thank you, Tamara. Um, we've got guest speakers, including, um, first of all, first up, Anna Scape, who's Professor of Radio Astronomy at the University of Manchester and a Turing AI Fellow. We also have, next slide please, Betsy Marithi, who's a Research Fellow at Data Science Unit of iLab Africa at Strathmore University in Nairobi. Strathmore University is uh, one of our partner institutions at JGI and the University of Bristol. Next slide please. And then we're going to have Dr. Emma Kuritz, who is one of our data science specialists um, here in the core team of, um, of the Gene Golding Institute at Bristol. Next slide, please. And our colleague, Dr. Haran Cho, who's a senior lecturer in the School of Mathematics and on the steering committee of the JGI. So fantastic to welcome her to give us a short talk today. And finally, from our industrial partner of LV General Insurance, we've got Dr. Merve Alanyani, who's um, Head of Data Science Academic Partnerships. So we've got a great lineup for you today. I'm just gonna hand over to um, Tamara to give us a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll get cracking with the first talk. Thanks, Tamara. Yep, so we will be recording this event. We will also be posting some links in the chat box to our code of conduct. So please keep a lookout for that. And that is... Um, going to come up in a minute. So, thank you. Great, thank you. And if we're hoping for a question and answer session at the end, hoping to save some time for that, we're going to use Slido for that. So if you could um, open up the Slido link, which Kiara is just putting into the chat now, and I'll speak slowly so that you can do that. Um, and then as we go along, I'll keep an eye on the questions that are coming in and curate um, a question and answer session at the end. Fantastic. So I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Professor Anna Skay from the University of Manchester. Over to you, Anna. Oh, thank you very much, Kate, and um, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about my career in data science, um, how I got to be doing what I'm doing, and um, uh, I was also asked to mention the thing that I'm most proud of and then what it's like to be a woman working in my particular community. So that's what I'm gonna finish up with. So I work at the, the University of Manchester at the Jodrell Bank Centre for Astrophysics. Um, but my research is really on the use of artificial intelligence for extracting scientific impact from, from very data intensive science experiments. So for me, that means radio astronomy um, and a project called the Square Kilometre Array. But um, it started somewhere quite differently, um, which was, of course, in Bristol, um, in the uh, the H. H. Wills Physics Building. Um, you can see here, and um, it was really sort of the fourth year of the the physics undergraduate course that started me on the the career track that I've continued with. And this 
this telescope that you can see on the right hand side. So I, I don't know if everyone knows, but there is a telescope at the top of the, the physics building, uh, radio telescope, the, the Coldrick Observatory. Um, so for me, this was my first entry into real astrophysics. Um, but it was also the first opportunity I got to write a piece of software. Um, and for my for my fourth year project, I actually wrote some software that uh, helped this telescope to track and most importantly, to detect the sun, <laughs> which uh, um, sounds <laughs> sounds less impressive than it probably should do. But it couldn't previously see the sun. So I felt that was quite a win. Um, and uh, so I started off in um, in actually in Visual Basic. Visual Basic VBA and VB script, um, which for many for many people may have ended their career because they're not very nice computing languages, I think. Um, but I persisted, um, and that took me into um, doing a PhD in astronomy and specifically in um, handling the data from telescopes and analyzing the data. So I moved on from from the Coldrick Observatory uh, through a couple of uh, cosmic microwave background experiments and onto the LOFAR telescope, which is a quite a different beast. This is a telescope that's spread all across Europe. It's a network of antennas. And what I did in this context was, um, well, a number of things, but specifically I designed the calibration model for this telescope, which was a data-driven model that used statistical or Bayesian model selection in order to, to make the telescope usable, if you like. So. Um, that was the, the next step. And then I sort of just carried on from there. So if we skip forward a bit, I then get to got to work with an even larger telescope. In fact, one that didn't yet exist, which is the, the square kilometer array. So for the design of this telescope, which won't actually come online until 2027, um, I designed the, the imaging pipelines, so the, the, the data pipelines. And this is where um, the sort of the data intensive part of my career started. Um, because the SKA telescope, although it's uh, also a, a very large scientific facility, it is first and foremost a big data machine. Um, and it has data rates that dwarf even most large commercial um, data enterprises. And I'm talking about things like Facebook and Google when I say that. Um, so the, the data analytics and the data pipelines for this telescope are very important. Um, but so are how we get those data to the users. So from designing um, the components of the telescope itself, I then um, moved on to designing the, the computing centers around the world that would be um, used to, to disseminate these data to, uh, um, to astronomy, the astronomy community and the scientific community more widely. And more specifically, um, I led the design of the, the compute and the storage for, for the European um, data center in this network, which is a, a truly global project. Um, so whilst I was doing this, one thing that was became increasingly clear to me that was that making the data available would not be enough. And that to actually extract science from the data, what we would need would be a paradigm shift in terms of the way that we handled those data and how we analyzed them. Um, and so um, now, what I do is I design the artificial intelligence solutions that will allow us to analyze the data from the square kilometer array. Um, and I'm really going back to sort of the same level as detecting the sun at this point, because even the most fundamental things that we do in astronomy, sort of the by eye things, will need to be automated for a telescope like the SKA. Um, and so, how we do that in a way that doesn't introduce um, biases into our scientific results um, and that has a well quantified uncertainty associated with the outputs from those AI algorithms is really the, the focus of my research. Um, and I do this in a, a domain specific way. So I do it specifically for the astronomy data because one of the things that we find, and I'm sure the other speakers will also touch on this, is that when you work with real data, um, the AI solutions that often appear in the literature don't perform in the same way that they do when they're measured against benchmarking data sets. Um, so that's sort of a, a whistle stop tour of my career. Um, but when I come to think about the, the thing that I'm perhaps most proud of 
in my career it's it's not necessarily the um the, the science or the um or the, the the projects that i've worked on although i am i am proud of those um i think the thing that i'm most proud of was a project that we set up to actually um empower new communities to work on data science um, and this is specifically again around the square kilometer array project because one of the telescopes for the square kilometer array is going to be built in in southern africa um, and it's supported by a partnership of um, nine countries across africa many of which don't have um, astrophysics communities so one of the things that we wanted to do was to help those countries to grow their research communities um, specifically with a view towards the more data intensive <clears throat> aspects of the SKA um, because those are the aspects that will be most economically important as well um, and so the the DARA big data project um, is a, a joint project that it was supported by the UK and South African governments in order to do that um, I can't talk about it in detail because we're limited to time, but um, if anyone's interested in it, there's a, a website and a, a Twitter link here um, for people to take a look at. And then the final question I was, I was asked um, by, by Tamara to, to think about for this presentation was um, what it's like to be a woman in my community. So by community here, I've, I've, I'm talking about the, the science, AI, um, and computing communities because those are those are the the areas that I've worked in and um, the kind of the points that I think are most prominent to me um, and firstly I should say that I really enjoy working in my community I, I love what I do um, I think it's a great career for for a woman or for anyone um, but obviously as a woman you often have a different experience um, in a field that's that's predominantly male so, so these were my, my reflections, if you like. Um, so firstly, I think that in my community, as a woman, you need to be prepared to be the only woman in the room on many occasions, even when there are quite a lot of other people there. Um, and this is uh, increasingly the case as you go up in levels of seniority. Um, and it's, it can be quite intimidating. And so being prepared for that and being aware of that is, is, is something worth thinking about in advance. Um, you often need to be prepared to repeat yourself, to be heard. And I think this is um, something that unfortunately affects a lot of junior women, especially in, the, in this community. Um, it's, a, <laughs> it's just a, an unfortunate truth that, uh, that when women speak up in meetings, um, their views are not necessarily ignored, but perhaps just sort of humoured and passed over oftentimes. Um, and then you'll hear them repeated by someone else and, and given credit, which is, which is an infuriating situation. Um, so if you want to be, if you want to get your views across, you have to repeat yourself. And also I think this is a lesson that for people who chair meetings um, to be very aware of um, and to, to really you know, come down on quite hard. Um, one thing I've noticed personally within my career is that, that the more senior you become, the more prepared you need to be to speak out on women's views. Um, and that is for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is that quite often you will be the only woman in the room. And if you don't say it, no one else is going to. Um, and it can make you unpopular, which is, uh, um, which is something else that you have to deal with. Um, but then the other aspect of that is that if you are the only woman in the room, you're often expected to speak on behalf of all women, which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think that as women, especially women becoming more senior in, in, in their careers, we need to be very aware of, of intersectional biases um, because I can't, I literally can't represent all women I would be doing with other women a disservice and that I would be, you know, it would be a pretense in many cases. So for myself, what I try to do is, is to be aware of those intersectional issues um, and to represent them as well as I can. But I think the true solution is really to, to try and amplify other women's voices rather than, rather than try, and, try and do it uniquely yourself. Um, because 
there are often, and I would say in most cases, always another woman who has more of a place to speak about an issue than you do. So um, speaking up for those women and putting them, giving them a platform is very important. And then the final point um, I wanted to make is that, you know, if, if, if you are daunted by, um, by these things or having to constantly do these things, also remember that you, you don't have to do them is the, the message. Um, and you can say no, right? And you should be prepared to say no because all of these things add on additional labor for women. Um, and it's often uncompensated labor. And so this kind of burden of service that falls on women and, and other minoritized groups um, is a real thing. And the consequence of that is burnout because you're expected to do it in addition to your own job, um, which is why you're there in the first place. Um, so I think that was, those are my, those are my reflections. Um, and I think my 10 minutes is probably up. That's so fantastic. I'll Thank you so much, Anna. Um, you know, Merve and I in the background are going, yes, that happened to me. <laughs> um, very, very familiar. And I, yeah, I, I support everything you're saying about um, providing opportunities for others around you and coming up behind us as well as, as, as senior women. I think that's, that's a really positive um, viewpoint. Thank you so much. That's great. We'll come back to you with questions at the end. So we'll now move on to Betsy. Um, Betsy Ruthie from our partner um, institution of Strathmore University in Nairobi. Betsy, over to you. Thank you, kids. Uh, started. Not my time. All right. So thank you all for joining us here as we celebrate women in data science. I am Betsy Ruthie. I am a research fellow at I Love Africa. I Love Africa is a research center with different wings. Um, it has a data science unit, which has three main strategy pillars around research, um, consulting, and uh, teaching data science in Africa. Um, so I'll just take you through a brief overview of my career journey. Um, so I always had a sort of passion for data. I started out as a business and information technology background. Um, I did PPIT here at Strathmore, and then I majored in database administration. So if you know what database administration, you're just kind of like looking after a company's data. But then there's also this aspect of reporting. So it was kind of my first um, introduction to utilize data to drive insights, where you kind of use data that's already stored, run SQL queries, and then generate reports that can be used for decision making. And it always excited me um, trying to find new ways to use data to generate insights. So that has always been there and like in the pipeline or in the history of data science, it's really early based technology. Um, but when I joined industry, unfortunately, I went and steered more into software development, and then I became a business analyst for about two years. Um, however, the passion for utilizing data kind of lingered on and then led me to my first hackathon. So the hackathon was organized by Open Institutes um, here in Kenya. They were trying to celebrate Open Data Day um, 2014. Uh, by utilizing the government had just started releasing data. So this open data wave had just hit um, governments. And so they wanted to kind of bring um, the local community of researchers and policymakers to try and see what they can do with that, um, with the data that has been, just been released and also to celebrate Open Data Day um, 2014. And I, preparing for this email, I kind of found um, and uh, at the email I wrote to the organizer stating that I am a business analyst at this company, but I have a huge interest in data mining and data exploits. So data, notice the word data exploits. Um, I guess we did have a word then for what data analytics, data science is. Um, anyway, in my region in Kenya. And so from the event, um, 
basically I volunteered to like document the different projects that were being conducted by the groups. Um, but it kind of opened my eyes um, what, what is possible data other than just reporting. Um, and so that uh, led me to seek uh, postgraduate opportunities around data. So I did my MSc um, in business analytics at the University of Kent, and then went ahead to do a PhD in the business and management um, at Royal Business School. Um, and so again, looking back, preparing for this, I found my MSc application later. And what was interesting for the research idea that I had at the time was kind of using photos from, so IBM had uh, the World is Our Lab um, photo contest. Um, so the contest was to challenge amateur and professional photographers to capture African challenges, city systems, and innovations. And then they would pick a winner who best portrayed um, the, the different themes. And so from my, my research idea for my MSc was around using the data they collected to kind of um, do some analysis to identify challenges in Africa and then tailor make solutions to solve them, which technically looking back now was a computer vision problem. Um, but I didn't have the right words to articulate them, right? Um, and overall, at the time around 2012, 2013, 2014, computer vision hadn't really gained the notoriety that they did. Um, looking back, I didn't pursue this for my MSc. I did something else with Tails Group. Um, maybe I should go back and try to find those photos and see what we can do with it. Um, but then, see, now that kind of led me into the trajectory that I've taken now up to now being a research fellow at ILAB Africa's Data Science Unit. Um, so at I Love Africa, I get to work at various data applications around very many domains. Um, at the moment, we are heavily looking at climate change, um, predicting extreme weather. But at the heart of my research interest is data analytics in healthcare operations management, which was the main focus of my PhD, um, which is still fresh. So it's still my greatest achievement. As, as for now, because I graduated last year. Um, so the main idea of my PhD was to look at whether we can identify effectiveness of a healthcare system by looking at how people utilize um, healthcare. And my main uh, focus was on older patients um, using emergency care, um, which is uh, quite a challenge. I did it in the UK, so I was using NHS Digital, and then there's all this narrative around how older patients' emergency care is probably not the most ideal um, way of delivering care, especially this routine care. There are other better ways. And so how can we identify and target um, specific um, individuals or subgroups within the patients and then tailor make um, either a package that can avoid them from ending up at emergency department. So moving back home, I realized that um, there's the joy of having access to such rich data. Um, so I got the chance to use um, NHS digital data, but coming back home, we do not have the luxury of having data collected from electronic healthcare records or electronic medical records, but we still have systems in place. So make challenge now on, in terms of the research focus is how can we use existing systems to still drive data-driven insights. So for instance, we have um, the Kenya Health Information System, which collects data at indicator level and aggregated at facility, then county, then country level. So how can we use this type of data to still drive the same type of inference around the variation in health service utilization and its predictors, especially at lower geographical units um, to foster decision making in terms of accessibility or um, improving just delivery of care um, in the country. So that's kind of what I'm trying to find a way to to dive into. So leveraging routinely collected administrative data to kind of better understand the risk across different groupings of rather than patients looking at facilities and then extrapolate it to a population and then stratify those groups according to risk levels to project medical needs or cost of care and et cetera. Especially now with the deployment of universal healthcare um, kind of need to leverage that and see if we have the resources in place to actually see that everyone has access to free healthcare. Um, so that's kind of my research interest going forward. Um, the other thing 
that we were asked to talk about um, is our experience as women working in data science. So I guess some there the 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 the, um, the different sorry the different um, challenges, but I'd like to focus on the opportunities. Um, so gender diversity, especially in STEM worldwide, is still reported as being low, um, but there are strides to um, filling this gap. So my experience coming back, um, especially to Kenya, is that there is a strong sense of community, especially community building in the space of data science of STEM. Um, there are a lot of inspiring women around, um, so the, technically women are creating spaces where they can collaborate and grow. And then some of these examples are WEEDS, um, which is currently hosting their hackathon. Um, and then our red ladies was um, an advert um, about our users. So our ladies is a community that I should probably um, interact with more. Um, but I guess that's going to put in my to-do list. Um, so it's just spaces where women can come as a safe space. And it's not just limited to women. It's open to both men and women, but you kind of have a community whereby you don't feel judged, you have space to learn and grow. And then it would be interesting to kind of see how these communities of practice kind of develop and foster women data scientists, especially from traditionally underrepresented groups. So research has shown tech over in terms of computational, um, in supercomputing communities of practice have been shown to um, improve underrepresentation of women. So it would be a nice, interesting piece of research to see whether the communities of practice around data science in um, underrepresented groups actually has a way of fostering and improving um, the underrepresentation. And then the other thing as a woman in data science, especially not coming from a heavy, heavily computational or mathematical background, it, data science can be a bit intimidating. Um, you just have sometimes uh, you feel the mathematics is just beyond you and the learning curve sometimes can be so steep. Um, but I guess the encouragement I can provide is just um, there's, a, there's a drive to, for continuous learning. Um, just ask questions, asking questions that will make you look stupid um, and just feel that you belong. So on the space, the space, data science space is quite wide. You can find your own niche area and own it. Um, you don't have to be one thing or the other. Uh, you don't have to listen to naysayers, just on the space, always continue kind of learning and building on what you know, and then, you know, find a community because um, you can't do it alone. So I guess that's my time. Um, I'll hand it back to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, there are some organizations there I didn't hear of. I want to find out more. I'm going to have to ask you some questions. Yes. Women in data. I want to know about the fierce women. <laughs> I'm going to ask you yes. later. Um, okay. Thank you so much. And just remind people, please do put your questions in Slido and we'll come back to them at the end. So our third speaker is our very own Emma Kuritz from the JGI Data Science team. Over to you, Emma. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be here to celebrate International Women's Day. Um, so in my talk, I wanted to, I've taken a little bit of a kind of meandering career path as well so I thought I'd go through a little bit of my background uh, before talking about my experience being a woman in this field. Um, so I'll start with a kind of profile slide um, from which you'll see that my background is actually in experimental particle physics. Um, I uh, went to Stockholm in Sweden to do my PhD um, but spent much of my, um, my PhD and, and subsequent postdoctoral years uh, based at the European Particle Physics Laboratory at CERN, um, working on one of the large experimental collaborations there. So through there, I um, had a, a wide ranging experience in, in kind of large scale data analysis and statistical modeling um, and software development and things like that. Before kind of coming back to the UK and doing a, a brief foray into um, working in one of the analytical departments of the government, um, before settling here at the Gene Golding Institute, where I've been for uh, just over a year now, um, working as a data scientist. And here I'm happy to say that I've been able to indulge some of my, my, um, my, my physics kind of mojo still. Uh, I've still got some ties with some of the 
collaborations uh, with whom I worked with at CERN. Um, but I've also formed lots of new collaborations with some external partners as well. Um, and so I just wanted to take a couple of slides to explain how I've kind of drawn parallels between what I the kind of work that I did at CERN and, and how I'm applying that now to one of one of the projects that I'm that I'm working on. Um, so particle physics is a field of big data. Um, just to give an idea of scale when it's in operation, the particle accelerator, um, which provides our data at CERN, um, is colliding protons at 40 million times per second. So just to give you an idea of the, the, the rate of, of data that's, uh, that's being literally thrown at us um, at, the, at the laboratory. Um, so this is obviously a technical challenge, um, but the experimental collaborations that harness this data are also very large with, with uh, sometimes thousands of scientists um, all working together as a team to collect, uh, curate, and of course, ultimately analyze this data. Um, so this demands um, uh, very kind of uh, complex automated data pipelines, which allow us to collect and validate and quality assure this data um, before that data is provided to, to physicists to analyze. Um, and I actually spent a lot of my time, in addition to the kind of physics analysis, um, working on this kind of validation and quality assurance process. Um, and, and, it, and it really gave me a true appreciation for the importance of this stage in the analytical pipeline. Um, so on the next slide, I'm just showing kind of a diagram of black boxes, which I think can be used to well describe many analytical pipelines. Uh, you have the data collection, which, as I said, in this at this point is uh, smashing particles together um, and, and measuring the, the, the kind of remnants in our particle detectors. And that data is then processed into something a little bit more meaningful um, and then begins this iterative process of exploring that data, validating it, possibly cleaning it. There might be some calibrations um, indeed or corrections that need to be made. Um, and this all has to happen before the data gets passed on and released for analysis, because if you have trash going into your model, then you're going to get trash coming out. Um, and this stage can sometimes be a little bit boring, but it's so important uh, for, for, for actually getting some, some really high quality results um, out at the end. Um, but as I said, so this is, I've given an example of what the, with some images of how this looked like for particle physics. Um, but as I said, this could kind of be any generic data science pipeline. And in principle, we, we have data collection and this needn't be particle collision data. It could be healthcare data or, um, uh, it could be weather data, it could be data derived from literature or from the internet. Um, and all, you'll always need to have these steps in order to, to process, perhaps link, validate, clean, um, and eventually put that data forward for, um, for, for modeling purposes. Um, so now at the Jean Golding Institute, I find myself working um, across domains and often very much out of my comfort zone in terms of domain. Um, but I still find that I'm able to draw on some of these principles that I that I honed um, and learned during my time in particle physics. Um, so one of the areas that I'm applying this to now is, is an exciting project uh, working with health data. Um, so in, in health, um, like in many fields, um, artificial intelligence has potential to really revolutionize um, uh, the field. Um, but in order to develop and experiment uh, with algorithms and, and applications, um, it's really important that uh, research and development practices are facilitated. And there do tend to be um, challenges, of course, that, that, that could uh, stand in the way of this to some extent. Um, and one real issue with a lot of healthcare research is the availability of or access to data. Um, obviously, often we're talking about quite sensitive data, um, data belonging to individuals. Um, so there are security and privacy concerns. Um, and more practically speaking, often data is siloed in kind of disjoint sources and needs to be brought together somehow. And, and how do you do that when, you know, it's all different formats and has different rules for access and this all becomes very complicated. Um, but here again, what we'd really like is to have a kind of another data science pipeline where we're kind of mirroring the um, decision process that clinicians will make. So the, 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 the particular project that I'm working on at the moment is to do with decision support for treatment in stroke cases. And here we would have 
medical imaging, for example, clinical data, perhaps patient medical history. Um, and the clinician acts as the kind of machine that draws in all of this data and, and uses their domain knowledge and um, analyzes visually the images and, and checks through the clinical data. And that helps inform the treatment decision for that, that they will go forward with with their, with their patient. Um, so how do we provide a kind of pipeline that will, that will at least take us to that kind of data collection and validation and then ready it for preparation for decision to support algorithm development? Um, so that's a project that I'm working on at the moment where we're working with the NHS and an industrial partner to um, scope and pilot a database that has automated pipelines for linking and processing and validating this data and providing it to the research community for model development. Um, in doing this, we hope to develop a community of health data science um, and clinical researchers who can work collaboratively on this, collaboratively on this data set um, and help inform its shape and, and, and how, it, how it looks going forward. Um, so this is really exciting for me to be applying kind of what I learned way back when during my PhD and in, in my early years working in particle physics um, to a completely different but very worthwhile field um, um, now at the Gene Golding Institute. Um, but of course we're here to celebrate International Women's Day and I, I like the other speakers wanted to spend a moment reflecting on my um, journey and my experiences as a woman in data science, but also, of course, in, phys in physics, in a, in a STEM subject. Um, and I think for me, particularly when I was a student and, and, and as a PhD student as well, um, I definitely drew a lot of inspiration from female leaders in, in my area. It was, I, I don't think I realized at the time how important it was for me and just how much I ident identified with um, these women who were in leadership roles in the field. Um, and it really struck me that this, this really, demonstrates how much representation matters. It's so important to, particularly when you're starting out, to have, um, to see yourself represented in the community that you're trying to integrate into. Um, but but even, even very pragmatically as a data scientist, um, about the kind of thinking about the future of the field, if we're truly, if we truly want to harness the power of data, we are going to require input from a variety of individuals because everybody brings with them, their own experiences and their own perspectives. Um, and as I kind of touched upon earlier, um, trash in, trash out, if you have a biased data set, um, your AI algorithm isn't going to be able to counter those biases. The subtle societal biases will prevail. And um, I encourage you to Google things about uh, how much more likely women are to be injured in a car accident because of the design of seatbelts and how crash test dummies are designed to represent the average adult male. Um, these, these things are very prevalent in society. So if women aren't well represented, if indeed we are all well represented, we do miss out on these insights brought by diverse participation. Um, but that's all, you know, very logical. But also we, we want women to, we want as women to be able to feel free to, to participate in these technical fields. And as already addressed, we are, we do tend to be a minority. Um, Anna mentioned you've kind of got to become comfortable with being the only woman in a room. And, and that kind of, the kind of pressure that that could bring with it does add to your mental load and it does make your job that much harder. Um, in this field, I have found that, the working environment can be quite competitive. Um, I've experienced firsthand the kind of unconscious bias that you can see in things like recruitment, recruitment and opportunity processes. Um, and again, as, as Anna said, being talked over or, or repeated like a parrot in a, in a meeting, um, it, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. And when it's happening to you, it's very difficult to speak up um, to counter it. Um, which is why I just wanted to pick up again on something that Anna said, which is that it, it, it's really important that we advocate for one another. And, and that if you see this happening, um, whether you're a woman or not, to, to kind of just gently point out that it did happen. Because what I've found talking with male colleagues over the years is um, sometimes people really don't seem to notice that they're doing it. Um, it can be quite unconscious. Um, so, so what can we do? I, I think it's just really important to promote inclusive research environments where we foster a culture where not just women but everyone really do uh, feel that they can be heard um, and I think just having an awareness of these diversity issues that, that, that they are there and that they are real um, and and you know pursue diversity in, in the teams that you work and collaborate uh, with and in um, and value the knowledge that every individual brings to those teams 
And as a woman, I think, you know, what can, what can we do? We, we can be kind and, and self-aware. Um, I think it's really important we have forums like this where we can share our experiences with other women and we can, we can see similarities in, in, our, in our kind of shared experiences. Um, and I think, yeah, just, I, I just really want to say, um, even though it can be quite hard and, and, and disconcerting, just don't doubt that you have a right to be where you are, because you do. Um, that's all I've got to say. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Emma. You had some inspiring stuff. And I think you, uh, your description of your experiences is something that will re re resonate with many of us, I think. Uh, we'll come back to questions to remind you to use the Slido for the questions. We've got a, a nice few kind of load of questions coming in. So we're going to have a, um, a good discussion at the end, I think. So we'll move on to our penultimate speaker, who is Hiran Cho. Hiran, thank you very much. Over to you. Yes, um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, so, sorry. Yeah. So I'm senior lecturer in statistics in the School of Mathematics here in Bristol, and also Turing Fellow. Um, I received my PhD in statistics in 2011, joined Bristol as a lecturer in 2013, and has been here since. Um, I also got my undergraduate degree in statistics at Seoul National University in South Korea. Uh, I had always enjoyed mathematics as a student, but hadn't been really sure what I wanted to read at the university. And at an open day event organized by my alma mater, one of the professors in statistics described it as a field that opens the door for you to contribute to many other disciplines, such as natural sciences, social sciences, medicines, finance, etc. as previous speakers have demonstrated. Um, so it just struck me as something that I would like to pursue, and that's how it began for me. <laughs> So I'm interested in developing methodologies and understanding their theoretical underpinnings for high dimensional data sets that refers to large in the data title of my talk and also for time series data um, that refers to the dynamic part in the title of my talk. So today I will present a piece of my research that sits in the intersection of these two uh, which is data segmentation for high dimensional time series data sets. So before we begin, um, time series, uh, it's something I took from Wikipedia, is a data set, a series of data points indexed in time order. So it's something we encounter in our everyday life. Um, for example, a graph like this, we have seen it <laughs> so many times in the past few years. It's something I took from Google showing the number of COVID cases per day since March 2020. So it's a clearly time series data. Sometimes it's of interest to look at more than one series. So I just pulled out different statistics from the government website showing the number of daily deaths, patients and cases. And what we see is that these three series interact with each other, but also in a very dynamic way. So, for example, around the middle of this graph, we see that there is a peak in the number of cases, followed by the peak in the number of patients, followed by the number of deaths. So time series analysis is about capturing this um, dynamic interrelationship between time series data. And it can be about more than just three series. So here I have plotted daily volatilities of um, multiple US blue chip company stock prices. So on the X axis, we have time. On the Y axis, I have plotted different companies in different colors to represent their sectors. And what's interesting is how they interact with each other and how that interaction evolves over time. Um, there are, the aims in time series analysis are twofold. First, to describe um, the nature of the data by fitting a model, and to produce a forecast of the future based on the fitted model. And what is often assumed is um, that the properties of the time series data 
do not change over time, which allows you to fit a model. However, um, real lifetime series data often exhibit what is termed non-stationarities, meaning that uh, these stochastic properties are likely to change over time. And that's apart from the examples I have shown you before. And if we apply models designed for stationary data to these kind of data sets exhibiting non-stationarities, then it can produce inaccurate um, accuracies with uh, uh, forecasts which can lead to disastrous results. So that's where time series segmentation kicks in, where you assume that the data can be partitioned into pieces and each piece can be modeled as a stationary time series. Then a relevant task is to identify where it's, uh, such changes occur so that you can divide the data into pieces. And that is what time series segmentation is about. And this is a very much retrospective data analysis in that we have whole data and then look for changes that occurred in the past. But these uh, methods developed for time series segmentation can serve as some kind of benchmark when you are developing methodologies for real time monitoring of changes, which is a highly relevant task, for example, when you imagine um, trying to uh, see whether there is any attempt of cyber attack, cyber security. Um, so there are numerous methods that exist for this task in many, many different settings, and there, it, it is impossible for me to go through them. And also that's not the aim of this seminar. <laughs> so I just wanted to demonstrate what I did as an example. So going back to the previous data set, I have applied a methodology that aims at detecting changes in latent structures. So, and, and so I have added these vertical lines denoting where the changes occurred in some kind of dominant structure that um, is pervasive across the entire data set, sort of the representing the market effect. And also there are changes which are more like um, idiosyncratic to a pair or so of these, um, how interdependent these series are. And um, so what I'm showing here is that because these change points occurred around, for example, the great financial crisis, and also this change point refers to when the COVID-19 lockdown began, um, I have plotted three different segments underlying network showing how these series interact with each, with each other, how they are interdependent with one another in the form of networks. And indeed, the underlying structure does seem to vary over time. Uh, so it's just, um, I just wanted to quickly um, illustrate a piece of my research and also motivate data segmentation as some kind of a default data analytic tool that can be attempt before applying more sophisticated machine learning techniques that are more suitable when you are dealing with stationary data. And um, I don't have a slide for it, but I just thought I'd briefly speak about what it's like to be a woman, particularly in areas like mathematics. So for example, I'm the only female academic in the Institute for Statistical Science, which makes it hard for me to imagine um, what kind of a more senior female leadership profile I can relate to and strive to become. Um, so I really appreciate this kind of event where we can interact with each other. And also at the same time, I try to watch out for female students who are considering to do PhD or further studies in math, because that's how it can slowly change over time. And for example, in School of Math, we organize an open day event for women and non-binary students considering further studies in mathematics around November each year. So if you're interested, do watch out. Um, thank you for listening. 
Erin, thank you so much. Lovely to hear a bit more about your, your recent research as well. I haven't seen that before, so that's a real, a real treat. Thank mm -hmm. you. We'll come back for questions and we'll move to our last speaker, um, Merve, who is um, going to introduce herself. She's from LV General Insurance, which is a strategic partner of the University of Bristol. Over to you. Thank you so much. Hello everyone and happy Women's Day. It's such an honour to be here as a speaker, so thank you for inviting me, thank you for having me. And it's so nice actually having Kate with me here today, so we have like a real um, in-person audience. Um, so today I'll talk a bit about my own personal experience, um, how I got into data science, um, how I transitioned into um, industry from academia. Um, so it all started by uh, my computer science degree, um, kind of mainstream. Um, so I did my undergrad in computer science back in my home country, Turkey. And looking back, actually, on our final year or fourth year, we were asked to do a senior project which lasted for a year. And it basically determines a big chunk of your final uh, mark for that year. And Looking back, that project was actually a data science project that I chose um, without realising because data science wasn't a buzzword back then. Uh, neural networks were though. Um, and it was basically analysing um, data coming from synthetic aperture radar. And it, it sounds quite trivial now, but try to segment the um, image into land, sea and um, like urban area. The, the buildings basically. I massively enjoyed that project and and then I wanted to go a bit further uh, in academia and then I applied for a master's program um, on complex system science. So that was a bit of an unusual program. That was a Erasmus Mundus program uh, that I did in two separate universities. So I, I moved here, the UK, to University of Warwick, and then I moved halfway through to Sweden, uh, University of Chalmers, to do the, um, to finish my um, master's. And it was in an intersection. So when I was at Warwick, I was under the maths department, but the complexity centre was sitting between maths, statistics, computer science, but also social sciences to an extent. And then when I was in Sweden, I was part of applied physics. But again, it was quite interdisciplinary. So this is when I started becoming a bit more interdisciplinary and hopping around um, departments. And that was when I actually met my um, PhD supervisors when I did my um, thesis um, in MSc. And then I did my PhD in a field called computational social science or uh, social data science uh, at University of Warwick, at Warwick Business School. So basically back in those days, I wasn't only hopping between countries or cities, but I was also hopping between different departments, which um, I think contributed a lot, um, the knowledge that I gained um, and helped me a lot understanding different viewpoints coming from different backgrounds and expertise. Um, so to, during, during the, those academic years, I also worked as a teaching assistant, research assistant and research associate, both at um, Warwick and also the Alan Turing Institute, where I actually finished my um, PhD. And afterwards, I wanted a bit of a change. Um, my PhD was quite applied, uh, so I wanted to try the industry side a bit. And three years ago, I joined LV, LV General Insurance, as a data scientist. I'll, I'll talk about our team in a bit. Um, but going back to my um, career, um, after a year being a data scientist, I became lead data scientist and my responsibilities shifted, um, still being hands-on working on um, use cases and projects, but also leading the best practices in the team, um, ensuring technical excellence, uh, working on packages, um, also setting up some strategic direction in what we want to do, uh, supporting the team, trying out new methods as well. And I would say around six months ago, I moved into my current role, which is Head of Data Science Academic Partnerships and Research. So my role profile shifted slightly. Um, now I'm lead, leading internal uh, and collaborative academic research. Um, I'm setting the strategic route aligned together with the wider business as well as the data science team. Um, 
towards the, um, again, research and innovation. And the whole aim is also closing the research loop and basically drive innovation and improvements, bring back what we're learning from academia and academic research to our, our practices, um, not only in data science, but also in the um, wider business. But also part of my role is relationship building um, with um, academia and University of Bristol, which I'm coming to in a bit. So who are we as in LV and data science team? So how does life look um, in a commercial setting? If we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, we are a team of uh, more than 50 data scientists and data engineers currently um, as part of LV. Uh, we quadrupled in size since I joined the team. Um, so it was so nice to basically witness that um, change and shift as well. And um, I remember when I first joined LV, everyone's reaction was like, oh, insurance, isn't it a bit boring? Uh, but if you think of it, insurance is like data scientist heaven, because there's quite a lot of data and there's quite a lot of different types of data and also different types of challenges because it's a heavily regulated industry. So you really need to think differently for every project. And as a, as a data science team, we're working almost like an internal consultancy. We do not sit under a specific business um, function, but we basically serve across um, the entire company, um, giving, giving support to claims, for example, pricing, uh, fraud teams, marketing teams, underwriting teams, whoever basically needs um, a data science approach. And our motto is impacting every decision made in business using machine learning. Um, so what is also very, very interesting and exciting for myself is about two and a half years ago, LV has started a collaborative strategic partnership with the University of Bristol. Um, so we're closely connected to JGI and K and the team as well, but also um, the wider University of Bristol. So we are doing quite a lot. We are working collaboratively on research projects, applying for bids, um, and it's not just us commissioning research. There'll be team members from our team scoping the research collaboratively and then working on it collaboratively and moving forwards as well. But we're also supporting research, supporting DTCs, um, undergraduate students. Um, there's also a training aspect of knowledge share. We're doing lots of talks. We're hosting academics to give talks um, within our team and company. But at the same time, we also come to the University of Bristol to give um, talks as well. Also, uh, there's quite a lot of recruitment activity going on. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot we're doing in the last two and, a, two and a bit years. And today I'm actually in our Bristol office. Normally I'm based in um, London um, to, to, to meet uh, our collaborators. And I'm so happy to actually have this talk here in the um, Bristol office. So looking at the um, projects I'm most proud of about my um, career is um, I think the pr proudest moment I had in my life uh, was when I finished my PhD, when I saw, when I got the thesis in my hands, basically. And I don't think anything can beat that in my life. <laughs> Nothing else beat that in my life so far. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please, um, Tiara, thank you. Um, so my PhD was um, about quantifying human behavior um, with online images. So it's such a broad topic. Um, I had quite um, a few, three basically main um, main research projects underneath. Um, so one of them was tracking process with Flickr images, um, estimating socioeconomic attributes using Instagram, and forecasting an emergency through on one complaints uh, in New York City. So you you can see I. That gave me a good leverage. If I, I could talk to anyone, everyone can understand what I was doing for my PhD if I just left the technical bits um, out of it. So that it was quite applied. Um, it was trying to help um, solve problems arising in social sciences, um, not stripping the traditional social science approaches, but creating new approaches that would complement um, and take the research basically forward. So um, that's, I, I think I can say, the the biggest project that I'm uh, massively proud of. Um, and moving on to LV, um, I've worked on quite a few projects, but um, one to, I think, give a big shout out is, again, quite similar to my um, PhD, which is linked to analysing images. 
If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, was identifying total loss using images in addition to the um, structured data that we have. Um, this was the very first image use case that the team did, and it aligned really well um, with my PhD as well. So I managed to bring the knowledge I actually gained in my academic background to uh, my new industry setting. Um, and then we took it forward and I actually got the exposure of how to integrate those models in real life systems and basically started asking different questions. Um, more thinking about the business constraints, for example, and how, how to scale the project given the business constraints as well. So that 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 was also quite valuable seeing two, two sides of the coin almost. Um, before I finish, I um, quickly want to mention a few things about the challenges I faced in, in my career as being a um, woman. I would just echo all of the um, previous speakers. They, they've they put it out wonderfully, being the only woman in the room um, is like a pain, basically. Um, it, it happens quite a lot. It happened back when I was back in academia. It's happening now. But um, I think I always felt I was quite lucky because I haven't personally experienced anything that's stopping me, or maybe I didn't pick up the signs around me, or I was, I'm was i lucky to be surrounded by allies and in my, in my bubble um, in a way that I didn't feel like that is a barrier for me that I'm bouncing back. But talking to quite a lot of people, again, during my academic career and now I'm in commercial world, I got approached by quite a lot of more more junior um, women then saying, oh, I really wanted to choose computer science, but I didn't go because it was only boys that was applying. But they ended up with um, doing something data science-y. They came back to their calling and that actually really hurt hearing. Um, and now I'm trying to do basically anything in my power, giving talks, showing girls, school, school kids, that they can actually do it. And it's the it's very important basically to speak up and share our experience and before I finish I just want to recommend a book that actually helped me a lot uh, called The Authority Gap by Marianne Sigurd. Um, I can put it on chat later on. Um, that helped me a lot to understand the scale of the, um, the um, gender um, bias and how to be a good ally but also I'm quite proud to to work for an employer that actually values it. We, we as a data science team are currently working on a DNI project to help the business to um, realize, uh, to basically measure the scale and, and act on it. And we're currently acting on it as a data science team as well. So thank you. Great, I'll come back. I'll pop back into view <laughs> briefly. <laughs> so so the, we're slightly pushed for time, but what I would like to do is just if you could unshare for a moment, what would be really lovely is if everybody could could flick their videos on for just a moment so that we can get a screenshot and prove that we were all here in the room. That would be really lovely. And we can all very quietly clap, give a round of applause for our, <laughs> for our fantastic speakers this morning. Thank you so much. It's been a real, real treat to welcome you all here to the University of Bristol virtually and share our experiences as women working in this environment. And obviously as a, as a director of a data science institute, um, I feel very strongly that one of, one of my roles is to give opportunities to allow us all to become visible and to make those connections. So, so several speakers this morning have said, you know, I'm the only woman in the room. And that's true. But what I want people to take away is the fact that you may be the only woman in the room, but you're not alone. You are supported by the community that we we, we kind of we work together to provide that support and, and give each other the confidence to take the steps that we need in our careers. So thank you very much. We do have a couple of questions. I'm going to try and squeeze a couple of questions in. I know that we're pushed for time. I understand if you have to go and apologies for that. Um, but it'd be really nice if we could just have a couple of these questions, um, tops and tails. Okay, so question one. Oh, oh, I need to go back. I just lost my, my Slido. Um, question one, what advice would you give someone who is just venturing into the data science field? Are there any platforms that I can subscribe to that will help the transition? Any of our panel members want to take that? We could unsquare this, unshare the Slido screen, thanks, Mar, just so we can see people around there. Anna, go ahead. Yeah, just um, one suggestion very quickly is that 
certainly in Manchester, the meetup scene, which is increasingly virtual these days, is really helpful for this. So it allows you to go along and see what other people are doing. And specifically, there are there are lots of sort of women in data science, women in AI, women in data meetups. So you can get quite a broad um, view of, of things that are that are going on. And if that doesn't exist in your in your city, um, then you can create it. So one of my students created the women in data or her plus data, it's called in, in Manchester. So I, I really recommend that. Yeah, here in Bristol, we've got definitely got Girl Geeks, which is quite fun. There's a meetup and Women in Tech also. I don't know if anyone knows of any others. Anyone come across any others in the city? Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, um, Emma, for that in the chat. Um, OK, great. Uh, question two. Um, what are the challenges working on big data projects with so many collaborators? Who wants to take that one? Maybe Emma? How do you negotiate all those collaborators in the projects? Yeah, I, I would love to answer that. I'm actually not sure if that question was, was explicitly talking about the Dara big data project. Um, um, oh, it may have been for Anna. Yeah, okay, yeah, for Anna. Um, okay, yes, I can, so, uh, so Dara Big Data is a project that involves 10 different countries, so 10 partner countries, plus multiple institutions in those com countries. So it's actually, um, it is complicated to, to balance all of that. Um, you do have to be um, very mindful um, because obviously, you know, some partners will be much more vocal than others. And uh, so you need to make sure that you balance representation and, and balance participation in the project. Um, one of the nice things that we've seen come out of it, which I think echoes something that Betsy said, was that um, we've noticed that a lot of the women who are actually creating the new research space, sorry, a lot of the people who are creating the new research spaces are women, um, which is really important because in the, certainly in the UK, I mean, a lot of the structural gendered problems we encounter are historic. So if you have women creating those new spaces from the get go, then it helps to avoid that moving forward. Um, so yeah, it's a brief answer. Yeah, thanks very much, Anna. And thanks to people who are putting links in the chat as well to community groups that we can join. So thanks to Betsy for our ladies and, um, and Emma for the um, Tech Ethics Bristol links as well. Really, really, oh, and Helen for, uh, was that WHub, WTHub.org? Thank you very much for those. I'll, I'll be checking them out for sure. Um, question for Betsy. What are the ratios of women versus men at different stages in your career? And how did you find that? How, you know, how did that impact on your experience? Um, so, oof, my career. Well, at the moment, um, the ratio of men to women isn't that bad because I think we are about four women in a team of perhaps 10. Um, so the ratio isn't like two to one, right? Um, there aren't a lot of women PhDs where I sit, but that the good thing about that, it kind of gives you audience. So if you tell someone you're a doctor, they kind of give you, there's a lot of um, respect and audience that's given to the fact that you are a PhD woman. Um, so like uh, where I work in the ILAP units, we have tried to have a little bit of gender diversity, um, I'm the only female PhD at the moment, but we do have other female data scientists as we go along. Um, and then in my other career, again, um, around my PhD, we, so it was a bit balanced because when you're in a PhD, you kind of have a mix of different people doing different things and not necessarily doing data science. Um, I think, I was at Warwick Business School, so you have different um, people doing different things, and there was there was a bit there was a bit of balance there. So I've never really been sort of the only woman in a space um, per se, because there's always been someone that I can look up to. Right, that's a that's a good news story. I think <laughs> fantastic. Um, next question to anyone, I think. 
is it common to change career to work in data science with no background in science? I'm doing an online course, but would you recommend a master's or other experience? Any of the speakers want to take that? People, people transferring from other backgrounds. I don't know, Mervyn, what do you think? Um, I, I can think from more like job application perspective. Um, I, I won't say you would necessarily need a master's. It really does depend on what you learned yourself and how it comes comes across during the interview. If you have like a portfolio of work on, let's say, like GitHub that you can show as a proof that you've you've done something yourself, it is as valuable, I would say, in a in a more commercial setting. Obviously, it depends on what level of role that you're going for. But I, I won't say it's impossible. It, it, it's very very possible. We also have quite a few team members coming from non mainstream backgrounds like maths, computer science or statistics, but more social sciences background, but they they had their own interests and they they learn extra skills to be a data scientist. So it's definitely possible. Having said that, I mean, I think I think there are some really good master's courses out there. So a few yeah. years ago, there was very little actually mm. on offer specifically yeah. in data science. But now yeah. there are there are kind yeah. of specialist courses. So if you're particularly interested in fintech, you'll find yeah. you find a dedicated course. Yeah. If you're interested in management, if you're interested mm. in analytics, you'll find a dedicated yeah. course. So it's worthwhile, I think, having a look. And mm. and some of them are courses that you can do part time. So yep. you can be working yeah. Yeah. and um, and kind of upskilling at the same time. Even even PhDs, we're currently supporting a part time, a few part time PhDs within our team as well. So definitely, yeah. Um, just one. Let's have one more question. I think. Thank you for all for all your questions. It's been really great to have this conversation at the end. There's one here that I think we maybe can all speak to. Um, how can we can support support one another practically as women in these fields? Is there one change we could all implement today? Great question. If we could change, if we could kind of implement one thing, what would it be? Anybody want to pipe up with a suggestion of what it might be? Yeah, Emma. Yeah, maybe I'll go. I think um, I think one thing that that we could all do is um, I think that when you particularly like coming back to kind of being in meetings and not feeling heard, or um, if if you feel like you're being overlooked, or you see somebody else maybe not getting the attention that they deserve. I think it's easy to become resigned to your lot. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, try not to be resigned and try to speak up, try to acknowledge when someone's saying something or try to put forward a suggestion for a collaborator who may have been unconsciously overlooked. I, I think really trying to advocate um, for other women. I think that's something that we could probably all try to do. <laughs> Great. Any last thoughts from anyone else, any of our panel? I think measuring the gap helps. Mm -hmm. That's basically what we were trying to, to show to the rest of the business. I look, this is where we need improvement and diversity in general. And you basically have a proof uh, to show in terms of like the pay in the, the bit that you can kind of prove that there's something that needs addressing or like the numbers. And then you can try to, um, acknowledge that but also consciously tackle um, because it's easy to kind of assume sometimes but it's when you show when you come with evidence <laughs> they, they do believe you and they actually take action yeah very good point so evidence evidence the gap okay so i think we probably can't let can't i can't hold you any longer although i think these conversations could go on for a long time it's been an enormous pleasure to welcome you all to us today i noticed in the room we also had um jean golding herself joining us which was lovely to see so um a kind of pioneer really for women in data science and somebody that we that we look up to and and, and value so thank you very much jean for joining us um just a quick if you like this if you've enjoyed this then come along to our showcase uh, which is going to be a celebration of Bristol Data Science um, University and um, collaborators in the M Shed, which is our industrial museum on the 7th of June. And we're going to be running our annual data week, um, which starts on the 13th of June. And there will be loads of open training, talks and workshops, competitions, uh, student facing events, um, talks from really senior people as well. So please do sign up to our mailing list if you're not already and you'll get all the information about that. And the sooner you can book on to particularly the training courses, the better. 
Um, so thank you to everybody. Massive round of applause. Particular thank, particular thank you to Kiara and Tamara who, who make these things look easy. But I promise 